The much besieged Job longs for a divine court from which he might seek redress and justice. A reading from the book of Job. Job said, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with them, and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there, or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. God has made <coughs> my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness, and thick darkness would cover my face. Shall we receive the good of, at the hand of God, and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord's word is active, probing the human heart and all creation, while we can yet boldly approach God's throne because Jesus, our great high priest, has known our weakness and temptations. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, 
but we have one who is in every aspect has been tested as we are yet without sin let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need the word of the lord Jesus counsels a man to sell all for the benefit of the poor and follow him. And he then teaches how hard it is for those with riches to enter the kingdom. Disciples who now surrender much will receive back all manner of new relationships to the age to come. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go. Sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, and every action of all our lives be always acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter or any of those, you know I promised you'd have two sermons today, two for the price of one, but I also promised that the first one would be very short. But there's something I just felt I needed to talk to you about. Like all of you, I've been impacted by the seemingly unending series of mass shootings. And like you, I've wondered what can be done. What would end this terror? There are lots of ideas floating around. I'm not gonna take sides on which one is the best. And we certainly need to remember the victims and all those who have been impacted by these terrible acts. To remember them and pray for them, that's very important. 
But today I want to ask for your additional prayers. See, as we worship here today, around our country there are, I don't know how many, let's say 20 people, most of them young men, who are sitting on their bed contemplating being the next mass shooter. I can't prove that sermon, but that statement, but I firmly believe it. There are people out there right now collecting guns, picking out targets, planning their big moment. So I'm asking your prayers for each one of them. God knows who they are. And we pray that they may cross paths with the, with the one person who can talk to them and get them to understand this is not the thing to do. And we, we pray that their, their hearts be softened, their minds cleared, and their spirits healed. We pray all that with confidence that God is with them and God is speaking to them and God is saying, don't do it. So ultimately our prayer is they will listen to God. So that's sermon number one. The other day I was reflecting on the many roles I have played on Stewardship Sunday. I certainly began as the person in the pew listening to the talks and the information and the pleas to pledge. And then I was appointed to the stewardship committee. I mean, who hasn't been there? And I was making the talks. I was asking people to consider pledging. Then I was elected to vestry and became senior warden. And I would be sitting there wondering what the results would be and what we could actually accomplish in the upcoming year. And then as a priest, my role has been to try to put it all into perspective and specifically into a theological perspective, the perspective of our relationship with God. And to be honest with you, I wasn't particularly excited about any of those roles. I mean, few people like asking for money. Few people like being asked for money. Religion and politics are actually more acceptable topics of conversation than how much money we earn. And the irony in all that is that Stewardship Sunday is about one of the very first commandments God gave us. In the first chapter of Genesis, Jesus tells human beings to be fruitful and multiply and to be stewards of all creation. Now, that, that's something we don't connect with real well because we don't use the term steward a lot. A, a steward is someone who's given authority and responsibility to care for the owner's property. So, for example, if you had a, a factory with a factory manager, or maybe the factory is owned by a multinational corporation, well, the factory manager is the steward for that corporation. The factory manager is the one trying to take care of what's, what's going on at that factory and make sure it's done well. Well, as I said, this Sunday is not my favorite one. And know that I'm not going to get into any of the specific needs of all saints. That's the job of the vestry and the finance committee and the stewardship team. They will answer your questions this afternoon during the luncheon and, and the cottage meetings which have been scheduled. I would urge you to attend. This year is particularly important because the information that is collected at these meetings, both the luncheon and the small groups, will be shared with the search committee and that will be, have an impact on the process of calling your next rector. So this, this is a really important year. Your new rector isn't going to come in and change everything so you don't recognize all sins. No, your new rector will come in and build on your traditions. But that said, having a new rector after 21 years is a big change. And the candidates who will look at All Saints, will look at the history and especially the recent history to get a, get a feel for where the church is going. The new beginning that that rector will bring to you 
will be built upon the strengths of this congregation. And all saints, all saints has so many strengths. I, I have to suspect you barely notice them anymore. After all, a church is not the building, it's, it's not the administration, it's not the programs, it's not even the outreach. A church is the people. And All Saints is a very strong, committed, loving, caring group of people. Understanding that the church is the people is why over the past few years, I've become to see Stewardship Sunday in a new light. It's about being good stewards of the church, of, of the people. And, and yeah, it takes money. We all know that. But we need to see money as a tool and not a goal. And when we can make that step, it takes on a totally different perspective. God has placed this church in our hand. Think about that. Reflect on it. In, in Genesis, we are told that God put all of creation in human hands. Now we are told that the specific community of All Saints Episcopal Church of Greensboro, North Carolina, has been placed in our hands by God. I think when we do reflect on that, the thought may be weakened somewhat because most of us tend to minimize God. We tend to reduce God into a good friend who's walking alongside of us, and there's nothing wrong with that image. That's part of who God is. But God is a million times more than that. Try to get in touch with the cre Creator. Try to get in touch with the entity who is so powerful that all the universe was created by a single word. I an image that might help. Somewhere in this room is probably an ant crawling around. Well, I want you to think about your relationship between yourself and that ant. Our relationship with God should be like the ant's relationship to us. Distant, indirect, hardly noticeable. That would be the, the logical relationship. But God, God has decided to, to reach out and be in relationship with us. And that's amazing. Now, imagine that our God, who is so much greater than we are, has given us a task to do. Not, not in the sense of an assignment, but in the sense of honoring us with a role in creation. We are honored by God to be part of God's work. God does not need us. God can take care of creation very well without our help. Thank you very much. No, God does not need us. But God allows us to be part of the care of, the stewardship of all creation. And that's the, the second part of understanding stewardship. The first part was the enormity of God. The second part is that God created it all including our very selves. God created the human race and each of us as individuals. There, ultimately, it all belongs to God. Our God has made it clear that we were created with the free will to make our own decisions, including the decision of how good a steward we will be. We have the freedom to harm the environment, to harm other people, to harm ourselves.